Okay, can you see it? Looks good. Okay. Um, so are you, are you uh, ready to start, Pavel? Yes, if necessary. <laughs> we can wait a minute to, <laughs> if you wanna uh, rest for a minute before we start. Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Um, well then, uh, welcome all once again to the Western Hemisphere. Oh, sorry, let me turn on the recording. Oh, Ron is now the host. So Ron has to turn on the recording. I can't do it. Or one of the co-hosts can do it. Oh. Great. What um, do you want me to turn on? It, it's on now, thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, welcome all to the Western Hemisphere Colloquium on uh, Geometry and Physics. Um, today, we're very happy to have Pavel Edingoff speaking on Hecke operators over local fields and an analytic approach to the geometric Langlands correspondence. Um, Pavel, how would you like to handle the questions? Well, people can just unmute themselves and ask them. Sure, great, all right. Um, so if you have a question, just, uh, just jump in. Um, or send them in chat if, if necessary, but we will, it's easier if the just people uh, just uh, say them aloud. Great. Um, and then, so the, the talk is one hour, and then there will be 15 minutes of time for questions also at the end. Um, yeah, I will so stop for questions uh, from time to time. Great. So take it away. Okay. Thank you very much. It's uh, my pleasure to speak at this seminar. Uh, I don't know very much about geometry and uh, much less about physics, but uh, let me try to say uh, some things uh, about some things that we uh, did with. Uh, so this is a, a joint work with uh, uh, Edward Frankel and David Kajdan, uh, and uh, it concerns uh, the development of an analytic approach to the geometric Langlands correspondence. Uh, so let me uh, first so I'll first uh, give a general overview, um, and then I will, uh, uh, for arbitrary uh, curve, and then I will uh, focus mostly on curves of genus zero, where we have, uh, where, which is the only case when we can prove anything interesting. Uh, but our conjectures concern uh, the case of general curve. So, uh, uh, so for me, X is going to be a smooth projective uh, algebraic curve uh, over complex numbers, uh, irreducible. Uh, although later complex numbers could be replaced with another local field, notably the real numbers, and maybe less interestingly to uh, uh, mathematical physicists, periodic numbers, uh, non Archimedean fields. And um, I will consider uh, this curve with distinct points, T1 through Tn. Uh, and uh, the uh, manifold uh, variety that I want to consider is uh, the moduli space of stable uh, parabolic bundles on X of degree M. Uh, so uh, what does it mean? Well, actually uh, I, I want to consider PGL2 bundles, which means that I consider just rank two vector bundles, but uh, um, I uh, consider the modular tensoring with line. So therefore degree is only well-defined uh, modulo two. So it's either zero or one. But uh, when I uh, think about a stable uh, parabolic PGL2 bundle, I will think of the representing, of a representing uh, rank two vector bundle. Uh, and I think uh, maybe a more correct uh, uh, terminology is that I will consider quasi parabolic bundles. There is some, uh, so, um, uh, uh, some difference between these two, but let me explain what, uh, so in, in, uh, in the literature in algebraic geometry, these are more often called, they're usually called quasi-parabolic, uh, but I will uh, just call them parabolic. So, uh, uh, so what is that? So, uh, uh, so parabolic bundle means that I uh, will, at all those points, Ti, I will fix a parabolic structure, which means uh, that, uh, so I have my, uh, okay, so I have my curve. And then I have uh, a point, and at this point, uh, so I have a, 
uh, rank two bundle. So I have a, a, a two dimensional plane at this point, and I'm going to fix a line there. So fixing a line is called fixing parabolic structure because uh, uh, basically uh, uh, this is uh, the same as uh, to uh, specify a reduction uh, to, to Borel subgroup of PGL2 at this point. Uh, and uh, so then uh, if you have, so that means that at each of those points, I'm going to have this line fixed. That's what a parabolic bundle will mean. So a vector bundle together with this data. And uh, then there is a notion of slope. So the usual notion of slope for uh, a vector bundle is the degree divided by ring. So in this case, it would be degree divided by two because I'm considering rank two bundles. Uh, but uh, uh, for parabolic bundles, I add n over four, where n is the number of parabolic points here. And then there is also a notion of slope for a line subbundle of E. Uh, namely, this is the degree over rank. So in this case, just the degree plus one half of the number of points, but not all points, but only those where the corresponding line is a fiber of this line bundle. So the line sub bundle goes through some of those lines. It doesn't go through others. And I only count those that it goes through, uh, call that number N sub L. Uh, and uh, I, sorry, it's N sub L. And uh, then we make the usual definition that this bundle is stable. If for every subbundle, for every line subbundle L of E, uh, S of L is less than S of T. And uh, uh, so, as usual, uh, happens uh, this uh, uh, moduli space of stable bundles is a smooth uh, variety, smooth uh, complex uh, variety. Uh, so of dimension, so the dimension of this is 3G minus 3 plus N. Uh, and uh, it uh, can be split into two uh, components. Uh, one is uh, degree zero and the other is degree one. And um, I'm going to consider, uh, so I want to do harmonic analysis on uh, these manifolds. And so I'm going to define the L2 space. Uh, well, I want to say square integrable functions, but that doesn't make sense because then I have to fix a measure. Um, I don't want to fix a measure. And uh, so uh, I will consider square integrable half densities. That canonically has a measure. Uh, so, so that canonically can be square of a square uh, square of a half density squared absolute value of a half density can be canonically integrated. So this space is well defined. It's a Hilbert space, and uh, so I have a total Hilbert space H, which is L two of the whole bun, uh, which is the sum of those two. And then I want to define some operators on uh, this space, which are similar to Heke operators in the theory of modular forms, except that we are doing them not over finite field, but over, uh, uh, but over uh, the complex field or maybe more general local. Field. So for this purpose, I need to define the notion of Heke modifications. It's an important geometric notion that, uh, uh, is central to the geometric Langlands program. Uh, and uh, so uh, this, uh, this is defined at a point X of my curve, which is uh, different from the parabolic point. Uh, by the way, if the genus, uh, so this, uh, I should say that uh, this uh, manifold is, is nice uh, when, uh, if genus is greater or equal to two, then I don't have to have any parabolic points. If genus is one, 
then I need one parabolic point to have a nice theory at least. And then if genus uh, is zero, then I need at least four. Well, it, if I have three parabolic points, actually it's also makes sense, but then uh, this manifold is just one point. Um, but otherwise, uh, for, for higher genus, genus greater or equal to two, any number of parabolic points from zero uh, to infinity is okay. So, uh, so what is Heike modification? So suppose I have a, a vector bundle, rank two vector bundle E, uh, then I'm going to fix uh, S, uh, which is a line in, uh, in the fiber EX. So it is, it is the same kind of thing as parabolic structure, except that I'm not thinking of it that way. So just uh, a line, I fix here a line. And then there is a notion of Heke modification of this bundle uh, at a point X along the line S. Um, so it's a new vector bundle uh, and it has a degree one larger than E. So if E had degree zero, for example, this would be a bundle of degree one. And this bundle is, uh, can be easily described by uh, saying what, uh, what are going to be its local holomorphic section. So near every point other than X, they are the same as before, uh, but uh, uh, so we only change the bundle E at a point X. Outside of X, this bundle uh, is canonically isomorphic to E, uh, but at X, uh, the holomorphic sections are meromorphic sections of E with at most first order pole at X and residue at this pole belonging to this line S. So residue is not a completely well-defined thing. Uh, uh, you can only talk about residues of one form, so it's not of sections, but uh, it's defined up to scaling and that's all we care about because we only need it to be in S. Now this uh, vector bundle is not necessarily stable, uh, but generically it will be. And uh, therefore uh, I can uh, define the following operator on the space age. So this is an operator that acts on uh, uh, half densities or fun functions or more precisely half densities on the space bun. Uh, and it acts in the following way. So HX, applied to psi is a new function. And at E, it uh, takes the following value. So it is the integral over, uh, so it's an average over all Heke modifications at the point X. It's the integral uh, of psi uh, of H X S of E uh, times the volume element DS. And the integral is over the projective line. So there are many questions that arise uh, with respect to this definition. Uh, so one question is, uh, uh, so what does it, uh, does it all mean? So what is DS, for example, we don't have any fixed, uh, any canonical uh, measure on this projective line. Uh, also, these are uh, not functions, but half density. So do, what do we really mean by this? Well, it turns out, uh, so this is a non-trivial question. But uh, the miracle is that uh, this thing uh, makes perfect sense uh, and it does not require any choices. So this follows from uh, some, uh, from the work of Bailenson and Greenfield. So there is a certain, uh, so you have to consider uh, Heike correspondence and uh, some kind of uh, line bundle on it uh, and uh, do some calculation. And uh, to make sure that uh, this type of thing is well defined. So if you define it in any coordinate system, you will get the same result. I will not go into the details of this in a general overview talk, but we will uh, uh, see what this operator looks like in uh, very concretely in the case of genus zero. Uh, and another question, uh, so this is a kind of algebraic geometry question that arises, algebraic geometers question. So what do we mean by this, given that these are not functions and we don't have a, a canonical measure and so on. But there is also analysts question, uh, which is that, uh, that uh, why is this operator well defined? Uh, why does this integral uh, converge even if it makes sense formally? And that's a, also a 
serious question, in fact, more complicated than the previous one. Uh, so uh, initially, uh, we can only say that this operator is densely defined. Uh, uh, namely, uh, for example, there is this uh, open set of uh, very stable bundles, uh, which is, uh, you know, bundles which do not admit the important Higgs field, and we can take uh, smooth functions supported on that open set. And then uh, you can show that uh, uh, the integral makes sense if you uh, apply it to a function like that. Um, so, uh, but I, but it's not clear a priori why it is well defined on the whole H. And uh, the first conjecture, uh, so in fact, we, we don't have a proof uh, that it is well defined. Uh, but, uh, in the, but the first conjecture is that these operators are well defined and moreover compact, self-adjoint and pairwise commuting for different values of X. So this is kind of the first main conjecture. So these operators are analogous to Hecke operators in number theory, which are extremely important. Uh, and uh, they, uh, uh, so uh, in these conjectures, so the compactness is really, uh, or even the boundedness of this operator uh, is uh, the main statement. It is the kind of hardest uh, part because when once that is known, self-adjointness and pairwise commuting uh, we'll uh, go along for the right. This is going to be easy. Uh, Self-adjoint will be just some uh, formal calculation, basically, and uh, uh, commuting at various different points follows just from the fact that Hickey modifications at different points can be done independently. Uh, so we can prove this theorem in genus zero. So I, I will assume uh, from now on that this is known. Uh, and uh, if this is not, but, but even if it is not known, I can talk about these Hecke operators uh, as densely defined operators. And uh, then there is a theorem, uh, which, uh, which is that uh, these operators, uh, so this is something that we can prove, that these operators uh, in an appropriate sense commute uh, with quantum Hitched Hamiltonians on uh, bun S of X. So here I should recall that Taylorson and Drinfeld defined uh, a quantum Hitchin system, uh, which is a certain uh, quantum integrable system on this uh, modular space, and uh, which uh, kind of uh, uh, encompasses uh, many, or maybe even most known examples of finite dimensional integrable systems, quantum integrable systems. and um, uh, and so the uh, statement is that these operators commute with uh, uh, this quantum Hitchin Hamilton. Well, you might ask, what does it mean commute? Well, there is an algebraic sense in which they commute, which means that there is a certain formal identity. And that's something that you can prove using, uh, you know, basically geometric uh, New England story. Uh, but uh, but there, is a, there is also an analytic uh, sense in which uh, they commute. So uh, I will not uh, get into this, but there is a little bit more than just algebra. Uh, but since uh, we have not proved yet uh, in general that these operators are bounded, then uh, and so ideally we want to know uh, that, uh, uh, so this quantum, so ideally, the, so the conje big conjecture is that uh, these quantum Hitchin Hamiltonians uh, plus their conjugates uh, form a collection of commuting uh, unbounded uh, self adjoint operators on this Hilbert space, uh, which commute strongly with uh, this HX in the sense of uh, functional analysis. And in the case of uh, genus zero, we know that, but uh, in uh, higher genus, this is a conjecture. Uh, so uh, maybe I should stop for questions at this point. Okay, I'm sorry, I have a stupid question. So could you say more about um, what you mean by the quantum Hitchin system? It's, it's a hypercalar manifold. You could view it as a, as a phase space in many ways. 
or it's, since it's hypercalar, you could consider it as the configuration space and take L2 functions on that space. What, what do you mean by the quantum Hitchin system exactly? Okay, so this is in the sense of Bailenson and Trinfeld. So uh, basically, well, we can think about in the following way. So let me make a, a little aside on the quantum Hitchin system. Oops, just a second. So this is a certain quantization uh, of the Hitchin system. So usual Hitchin system. Uh, is uh, so you have uh, 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 so cotangent bundle of uh, bun uh, x, and this uh, there is a Lagrangian uh, vibration uh, over uh, something uh, that is called b. So this is the Hitchin base. And uh, in the case of uh, GL2, this is uh, uh, H0 of uh, X with coefficients in K squared in the canonical uh, sheaf squared. Uh, and uh, mm, so this, this is the standard Hitchin system. And uh, so uh, quantum Hitchin system should be uh, map between quantization. So, so in terms of uh, uh, functions, this means that we have functions on B mapping to functions on T star of one. And that's uh, the image of this map is a commuted Poisson commuting algebra in all of, uh, in all of functions on T star one, which is the classical Hitchin system. And then the quantum system should be uh, uh, a similar uh, kind of thing. Uh, so it should be a commutative algebra of the same size. Uh, of the same size in or uh, quantization of this algebra of functions on T star one. So differential operators on one. Uh, uh, and uh, these are differential operators acting on half densities. And uh, Bielinson and Drinfeld uh, constructed uh, a map from uh, functions on, uh, not on B, but on some deformation of B, which is called space of orders. Uh, I will explain more about this later. Uh, into, uh, into differential operators on, on one, uh, acting on uh, half forms. And the way it is constructed is from a uh, representation theory of affine Lie algebra. So you basically write this bunch, so you should think about stack. And this is a loop group over uh, holomorphic loops or regular loops and over uh, 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 G of X, uh, let's say minus some point, for example. And uh, then, uh, on G of T, there are uh, 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 this, uh, so uh, differential operators, which are uh, uh, at the critical level, uh, which is the pagan Franke Casimirs. Critical level corresponds exactly to acting on half forms. And, uh, if you have a two-sided invariant differential operator on a group, then you can descend it to a double quotient. And uh, this uh, commuting differential operator, when you descend them to the double quotient, give you this quantum Hitchin system. Well, there is more details here than I uh, explained, but uh, the idea is this. So does it answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. okay, <clears throat> may I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, you said the wave function is the half density on bungee. Uh, so we don't have the further twisting regarding the parabolic structure at the mark point? No, no. If you have parabolic structure, yeah, you can't also twist. Uh, OK, so at the moment, I consider uh, it's considered untwisted. But, but it's true that uh, 
so if you introduce parabolic structure, then you enlarge your moduli space. So in, basically over each point of the old moduli space, you're going to have the flag manifold, in this case, P1, uh, possible parabolic structures. And so you will have differential operators on P1 and you can twist uh, by a line bundle, by a complex power of a line bundle on that P1. So that's, <coughs> that's a deformed uh, theory which I uh, will not describe, but, but it's definitely, it can be done and it makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, so let me uh, uh, continue to discuss the general picture. So, well, I will suppose that this conjecture is, uh, is true. Um, and so in this case, we can apply the Hilbert-Schmidt theorem, the spectral theorem for uh, compact uh, self-adjoint operators. Uh, and uh, this uh, tells us that the uh, operators HX uh, have a, a basis of eigenfunctions, uh, psi lambda. Uh, so it's going to be a basis of this Hilbert space. And uh, there are some, uh, eigenvalues, beta lambda of x, which are real value functions of x. Um, and they are actually not functions naturally, but uh, minus one half densities with respect to x. Uh, so uh, the reason is that uh, when, when I wrote this integral, I said that there were some algebraic geometry questions about it, which, what does this integral mean? So you have to choose uh, uh, a trivialization uh, <laughs> of kx near this point in order to... Uh, so basically when you define it, you will discover that it is valued in uh, kx to the minus one half rather than in all. And so uh, if you do it completely canonically. So, uh, and so what one might ask, what are, the, are these eigenvalues? What, they, what are they labeled by? And that's a question that we ask in geometric language and in also in the number theoretic language, how to describe eigenvalues of KK operators. And they're described in terms of the dual group. So, uh, and in this case, the dual group is SL2. And it turns out that you can uh, at least conjecturally also describe them in terms of the dual group. So the core of Langland's correspondence is when you describe eigenvalues of this sort, uh, this is called the automorphic side when you compute eigenvalues of KK operators and you describe it in terms of something that's called spectral side, uh, which has to do with the dual group. So it's ex exactly what we will do here. So the theorem is that uh, uh, for every uh, uh, eigenvector, so these lambdas are labels of eigenvectors. So for every lambda, uh, so this beta lambda of x is a solution of a certain differential equation on x, um, second order differential equation, which is called the Oper equation. It is defined by a, a real Oper. So let me explain what the real Oper is. So first of all, what is an Oper? So an Oper is a differential operator. This was the notion introduced by Bellinson and Drinfeld, and it is, uh, makes sense for any, uh, for any semi-simple group. But uh, for PG2, uh, so this is SL2. Uh, so I should say this is an SL2 author. And uh, for SL2, uh, it is uh, simply a differential operator acting from sections of K to the minus one half to K to the, uh, 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 to K to the three halves. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, and the condition that it's a real author is by definition is that the monodromy of, so this is in the case without parabolic points. In the case with parabolic points, you have to put a condition that it has unipotent monodromy. It has regular singularities and unipotent monodromy at those points. And uh, also the important condition that it's a real author, which means it uh, has monodromy. Uh, so it's monodromy group can be conjugated into SL2R 
or uh, equivalently to SU11. In other words, there is a basis in which monodromy is real, and there is another basis in which monodromy preserves an indefinite Hermitian form on the two-dimensional space with signature 1, 1. And this, uh, the, uh, the upper lambda is such that uh, this beta is a, a solution, is a, a solution of the differential equation L lambda beta equals zero. I know that uh, this is a holomorphic operator L lambda, but this function is real valued. So it is uh, only real analytic. Uh, and uh, so, in, in fact, uh, it also, for that reason, it will also satisfy the conjugate equation L lambda bar beta lambda is zero. So, uh, so in fact, it's going to be a, a real valued. Uh, so, uh, such operator normally doesn't have a single valued uh, holomorphic eigenfunction simply because a holomorphic uh, single valued function on a Riemann surface, compact Riemann surface is a constant, but uh, uh, it has a once that branch according to monodromy. So there is a basis F1 and F2 of such solution. Uh, and uh, uh, the existence of a real single valued solution uh, corresponds to exactly existence of a Hermitian form uh, preserved by the monodromy. Uh, indefinite Hermitian form because then we can form uh, this uh, uh, combination F1, F2 bar plus F2, F1 bar, uh, coupling holomorphic solutions with anti-holomorphic ones. And this uh, thing is going to satisfy the system and it will be single value because of the monodromy condition. Uh, I should mention that uh, you might ask why uh, the form has to be indefinite. Why, uh, why can't I take uh, monodromy in SU2, but actually there is a theorem that it never happens. So operas never have monodromy in SU2. So, uh, so you only can have the indefinite form. Uh, so maybe stop for questions again, any questions? All right, and then, uh, I want to, uh, so, uh, uh, so how is this connected to the usual geometric land ones? Uh, well, recall that according to Billinson and Greenfield, and this, this is something that I explained uh, earlier today. Um, so if A is this quantum uh, Hitchin system, uh, which is this commutative algebra uh, of differential operator, uh, then, uh, its spectrum is the set of operas, uh, which are operators of this form. It's a deformation of this uh, Hitchin base B. Basically, uh, uh, it's a quasi, so this B is just a quasi-classical version. So boy, basically the main difference is this Hitchin base is a vector space with a specific origin, but operas is an affine space. So it doesn't have uh, uh, any uh, distinguished point, at least uh, from algebraic point of view. Uh, so, and uh, for every oper, therefore, uh, we have a character of this algebra, which is evaluating the corresponding uh, uh, element of A at this oper. And uh, the proposition is that uh, for every uh, Hitchin operator, it also acts on this Psi lambda by eigenvalue, and the eigenvalue is chi of L lambda of D. So the character attached to this real author of D. So parameterization of uh, uh, characters of A by authors is part of the geometric Langlands program because it allows you for every author construct, to construct a, a, an automorphic sheaf, uh, the Hitchin D module, uh, which uh, uh, is generated by a solution of the uh, of this kind of equations, and uh, in the uh, uh, it's a part of the Langlands corresponding uh, corresponding to upper connections because not all connections are upper connections. Only a certain Lagrangian submanifold of connections is. 
but actually the general uh, geometric language correspondence uh, is obtained from uh, from this construction and so uh, so here we only see real authors we only see author connections and moreover only see real author connections not arbitrary connections only author connections and only corresponding to real monotony and the conjecture is that the spectrum uh, is simple and labeled by all real authors. So one thing we could not show, uh, I think even uh, in the genus zero case, is that every real author gives rise to an eigenfunction. It's, uh, one can show that it gives rise to a single valued uh, solution of the kitchen equations, but we had trouble showing that that function is in L2. So, uh, and part of the, had trouble showing that it's part of the spectrum. Uh, but in any case, we believe it to be true. And in many cases, we know it like in four, for four points on P1, for five points on P1. So we expect that to be true. And, and almost all of these, so as I said, the main conjecture is compactness and that's known in uh, genus zero. So essentially all of this picture is a, uh, established rigorously uh, in genus zero. And also I want to say that this makes sense uh, uh, over uh, other local fields, notably over the reals. There the parametrization, so over reals parametrization of eigenvalues uh, is, is different and we don't uh, know yet the general picture, but we have some uh, conjectures and uh, uh, this is work in progress. Uh, we've been discussing this a lot with uh, Gayota and Witten. Uh, and, uh, uh, so for other local fields, for non-Archimedean local fields, this is not so much of interest to physicists, but in that case, it is uh, even less clear what uh, parametrizes eigenvalues, uh, although we have some ideas. Uh, and uh, so uh, this is all, all just the beginning of the story. There is many interesting aspects. So let me um, give a few uh, historical uh, uh, references, uh, after which I will uh, explain some concrete stuff, some concrete examples. So I want to know that I do not know physics literature at all and mathematical literature on automorphic forms, I don't know very well either. So these are only some and not all historical references. Not all is the important part here. So as I mentioned, uh, so these Hecke operators uh, uh, for uh, local uh, over local field, uh, were first uh, introduced in the paper by Braverman and Kashdan in 2006. And uh, they were also considered by Kansevich in 2007, who studied them, uh, in particular, uh, uh, studied uh, some uh, questions about their eigenvalues over a non Archimedean field. Also, uh, this analytic Langlands uh, program, uh, uh, so, so the, the so Langlands wrote a paper in Russian in 2018, uh, in which he uh, uh, proposed some ideas that, that actually were uh, uh, implemented in this analytic Langlands program. In, in his papers, uh, the, this, uh, this setup wasn't present, but there was an idea that uh, geometric Langlands should be, uh, uh, can be, uh, 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 maybe considered from an analytic point of view where uh, D modules or perverse sheaves uh, are replaced by actual functions, which would be uh, basically solutions of this D, uh, D module. But of course, uh, he did not talk about D modules uh, and he, he just, uh, his proposal was basically that one should be able to uh, define Hecke operators and uh, uh, look at their eigenfunctions uh, over complex uh, field. Uh, but uh, uh, so uh, technically this was not achieved in his paper, but there were some ideas that uh, basically were implemented in our work. And uh, also I should mention Teschner's paper in 2017, uh, where uh, the problem of studying single valued uh, eigenfunctions uh, of uh, kitchen operators was uh, considered and uh, 
the idea that it should be related to real authors was proposed, but uh, there was no uh, Hilbert space formalism there. Uh, it wasn't clear how to do this. I should mention Baker's, Baker's uh, who uh, did this uh, uh, in, uh, I think, 2007 for uh, uh, P1 with four points. Uh, and uh, then there was a lot of physics literature. So there are two papers by Gayot and Witten that came out this year about uh, this uh, subject and uh, how it's related to four dimensional gauge theory. And there are many papers by uh, other physicists, notably Nick Rossoff and collaborators uh, this year and also earlier, which uh, uh, developed uh, uh, four dimensional uh, uh, gauge theory uh, point uh, of view and uh, its uh, connection to geometric Langlands uh, and uh, integrable systems. Uh, so I uh, cannot review this right now. There is also work of Kapustin and Witten, uh, which uh, connected uh, gauge theory with geometric Langlands. So there are many such papers and I'm not familiar with them. So I uh, uh, not familiar enough with them to, to comment. So uh, uh, I uh, now I want to uh, switch to another mode and uh, describe uh, uh, something uh, very concrete. So I want to talk about what these Hecke operators look like for uh, uh, P1 uh, with four points. So I have a genus zero curve and I have four parabolic points. So uh, I, I'm going to use this notation norm of X. So, uh, so actually uh, for real numbers, for, it's just the absolute value, but for complex numbers, uh, it might uh, seem to analysts a little bit weird. It's a square of the absolute value. So it's not a norm in the normal sense, uh, but it's a norm in the sense of local field. So for periodic field, the norm uh, of uh, uniformizer is the, inverse of the order of the uh, residue field. And uh, the reason this, uh, this is introduced, uh, so this is a, a kind of multiplicative character uh, of the multiplicative group of your field in such a way that this character is uh, how, it tells you how the Lebesgue measure is scaled when you uh, uh, apply homotopy transformation. So on the real line, it scales by absolute value and the complex it's scales by absolute value square. This is why we make this definition. And this allows us to write formulas uniformly so that it works, the same formula works for any local field. There is some, uh, it, it is nice to do it this way because then you see the natural uh, uh, relations between things uh, better. But um, you know, for physicists who care only about their comedian case, this would be a way to treat complex and real case on the same foot. So, uh, so we have a P1 and I have a parabolic uh, structures uh, at zero, one, uh, T and infinity. So four points uh, can be, uh, three of the points can be mapped to zero, one and infinity and the fourth point is T. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, the moduli of stable bundles is just P1 uh, over, uh, uh, so over the, your field minus the, those four points. Namely, uh, if you have a Y in P1 without these points, uh, then uh, you can define uh, the bundle, uh, just take O plus O, the trivial bundle, but they put the parabolic structures at the point zero. So uh, because it's trivial bundle, then parabolic structure is just a, a point in P1, which you can characterize by its coordinate. And at point zero, we put line, corresponding to zero, at one you put one, at t you put y, uh, and uh, at uh, infinity you put infinity. So that's uh, what it says here. And um, so you can check that this is stable. So here uh, slope is one half of degree of e plus one, because remember it was n over four, but n equals to uh, four here. And, uh, uh, slope of L is degree of L plus one half of NL. Um, 
Uh, and so this turns out to be stable whenever y is different from those uh, four points. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, also uh, when you have parabolic points, you can do a KK modification at the parabolic point um, uh, using the line, uh, parabolic line, which, uh, which is fixed there. And that gives you an isomorphism between band zero and band one. So, so actually you can, uh, this allows you to kind of mod out by this uh, Z mod two symmetry and uh, think about L2 on a single uh, component by band Z. So, uh, and then I want to write this Heike modification. Uh, well, if I identify band zero with band one, this Heike modification will transform degree zero bundle into a degree zero bundle. Uh, and uh, I can write it down in the coordinates of P1. And it turns out uh, it's easy to compute that the, uh, the way it works is the following. So if Y uh, is the original coordinate, then the coordinate of the new bundle will be S minus one times ST minus XY over S minus X, S minus one. Uh, well, I mentioned that the, this bundle is not always uh, stable. So that's why this function has poles, but uh, um, generically it's well-defined. And so you get this, uh, uh, by a uh, fractional linear transformation. And so then you have this Heike operator, well, slightly modified, it's not convenient to renormalize it by this product. And then uh, 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 I also uh, will consider half densities on P1 as, uh, as functions by multiplying by this uh, dx to the one half to write everything completely explicitly. So then uh, our Hilbert space will be just L2 of the line. So L2 of R for reals, L2 of C for complexes. And uh, then uh, you can write down the Heike operator and it is the following integral operator. So uh, it's the integral of Psi. So HX Psi of Y is integral of Psi of S minus one TS minus XY over S minus X S minus Y. And the measure, the real, the Re relevant measure turns out to be uh, the norm of ds over s minus x s minus one. So the reals it means just ds over absolute value s minus s x minus y. Over complex numbers it means ds ds bar over absolute value squared of the denominator. And uh, so using this formula you can compute the Schwartz kernel of this operator, which is the uh, like function k of y z. Uh, because this is not the, uh, here, uh, so no, uh, the usual Schwartz form of the, the integral operator is if you write psi of z and some kernel k of y z, and this is not of that form. So you need to make a change of variable. Uh, so this is a change of variable from uh, s to z, and this is a two to one map. So that's why you will get a factor of two. Uh, and uh, and the integration also will be only over the image of this map. So this uh, is going to matter for non uh, for complex numbers. It doesn't matter for the, for real numbers. You will be integrating only over uh, the set where some polynomial is positive. So in here is the result, which can be found in Kansevich 2007 paper. So we have this remarkable polynomial f t of x y z, which is written here. It's really remarkable in many ways. Somehow, uh, although I'm not sure I understand its algebra geometric meaning very well. Uh, and then uh, hx uh, psi of y is the integral essentially of one over the square root of the norm of this polynomial. Uh, there is a two coefficient. And then there is this also this theta it really means that I restrict integration only to the set where this uh, polynomial uh, is a square. So when it takes a value, which is a square in my field. So in the complex case, this is just one. In the real case, I only integrate over the set where this uh, uh, is positive. And uh, so, uh, and the one can check that this integral converges. Uh, so, uh, almost uh, 
always. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and so you can prove that this operator is compact. It's not very hard, and also self-adjoint. And the operators h x commute. So let me give you a completely explicit formula in the case of complex numbers. It's just uh, the integral of psi of z against one over the absolute value of that polynomial. So maybe I should stop for questions here. Okay, so I will skip uh, the proof and uh, 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 maybe I should uh, uh, mention that uh, this operator, how, how this hx behaves when x approaches one of the parabolic po uh, points. Uh, so there is a symmetry z2 cross z2, which permutes those parabolic points. So it's enough to say what happens when x goes to infinity. And then this operator actually goes to a scalar, except that it, uh, well, there is a leading uh, asymptotics, which is uh, log x over x, and then uh, times the identity, and then plus lower order charm. And there is a similar behavior at other points. So I will not stop uh, on this. But uh, so, so therefore we have a spectral decomposition. And so we have these eigenfunctions psi n, uh, which are normalized to unity. Uh, and uh, we have these distinct eigenvalues beta n. So we can choose this real and positive near infinity. And this fixes uniquely this psi n, the phase factor is fixed by saying that they're real and positive. And they are smooth uh, outside these points, 0, 1, t, and infinity, and have logarithmic singularities at those points. And uh, this function beta n actually turns out to be the same up to scaling as the eigenfunction psi n. That, that's the reason, uh, the reason for that is uh, this, uh, uh, basically uh, some, this is a peculiar property of the case of four points. And then you have a formula for the reproducing kernel, which is this one. Uh, and it follows from the fact that this polynomial is symmetric under the group S3. So symmetric under permutation of all X, Y, and Z. That's a specific, that's a, uh, that's a uh, peculiar case of uh, this case of four points where the moduli space and the curve are the same space actually. And uh, there is a multiplication law for the KK operators. Uh, and there is a, Okay, the formula for reproducing kernel can be written in this way. So there is a very explicit analysis you can do. Uh, and the, the spectrum is simple. And these operators have no common kernel. And uh, then you can, uh, in the complex in real case, there is this Hitchin operator, which in this case is just a single differential operator generating the algebra. It's the second order operator, which is given by this formula, dx, x, x minus one, x minus t dx plus x. And this is the Lame operator. Uh, so it can be brought to this form with the p function with the parameter one quarter. And the property of this operator that is key here is, uh, which I mentioned before in general, that ly minus lz applied to this one over the square root of this function is zero. And this implies that L commutes with the uh, HX with the KK operators. And uh, the eigenfunctions of the KK operators are actually Lame functions, therefore. They are just eigenfunctions of Lame operator for some eigenvalues lambda n. And the eigenvalues lambda n is a discrete set of eigenvalues uh, which, for which this system has a single valued solution, uh, which is given by this Hermitian combination here. Uh, so, uh, so this uh, uh, set of eigenvalues uh, looks like a, 
it looks like z like a lattice in c two-dimensional lattice in c but uh, but it is a little bit curved and it only becomes a straight lattice when you go to infinity and uh, there are some uh, zones there so it's it's a, it's a bit uh, tricky but it very roughly it looks like a two-dimensional lattice but uh, deformed uh, excuse me these are l2 functions right uh, these are uh, two functions. They are, uh, in fact, they only have logarithmic singularities. So they are L2 functions, yes. So this is same spectrum uh, uh, that I guess Nekrasov and I constructed? Uh, yeah, it's really, uh, so yes, it's related to, uh, to that. And uh, 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 yes, yeah, so it's, uh, Well, in fact, for, for this particular example, this was, this is also in this paper by Pekers uh, from uh, 2007, I think. Uh, but uh, but there is a uh, uh, but there is a uh, generalization of this to larger number of points, and then there it is more difficult to show that these are L2 eigenfunctions. Well, the, those ones I did with Rosli and Nekrasov actually in 2011. Uh, as far as I understand, for SL2 with any number of points, this has been cleared out yeah, 10 years ago. Well, I mean, we, we could not find a, a, a proof that uh, this is a complete system of eigenfunctions. <laughs> so is it, uh, I mean. Well, I mean, it depends what you call proof probably, but I, I don't know. I thought that the, I think that Tudor actually had looked at it and also Andy. They were in very special, anyway, the, of course, uh, uh, they were described in terms of the accessory parameters for the opers, right? So we were looking on the spectrum of the Hitchin Hamiltonians and they were described in terms of local systems for dual group. Yes. And, we had, we, and we had general formula for the eigenvalues which was verified actually by many people, including Teschner and others. Of course, it comes from gauge theory. I mean, I understand that it's kind of some physics there, but uh, the, the formulas were mathematically precise. Reason I'm asking just Pasha, for, for simple reason, I, I, I don't want to bring any history here. What would be these Hecke operators? It's a simple, simple way understood in terms of Lame, just, uh, so there are certain integral operators that commute uh, with Lamé operator. So, so in fact, uh, Rosen are those guys, excuse me, are those guys something that will enter in the separation of variables, kind of? Yes, it's a, they're, they're related to that too. Yes, it's so a, basically for periodic torda. This is something that's clearly discovered in eighties when he constructed separation of variables. Yes, it's related to separation of variables. Uh, so, uh, by separation of uh, variables, uh, transform uh, uh, these are going to be uh, the kernels of Hecke, integral kernels of Hecke operators are uh, transformed into something that uh, Kantsevich and Nadeski called uh, multiplication kernels. And they are written in terms of points on the curve. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Thanks, thanks. I, I, I think I understood better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so uh, uh, so as I mentioned, monodromy uh, of these uh, uh, has to be real and uh, uh, preserve an indefinite form. And uh, uh, so, in particular, uh, uh, if you look at the largest eigenvalue of this H x, which is the positive. Uh, for the positive eigenfunction, uh, then this uh, is exactly what you get from analytic uniformization of uh, this uh, surface, CP1 without four points. And, uh, and other eigenvalues correspond to other real projective structures uh, studied by uh, Goldman and by Falkings, uh, uh, which are not, uh, uh, analytic uniformization, but which uh, can be obtained from them using a procedure called uh, grafting. 
uh, and uh, so uh, so I, there is some discussion of analytic uniformization, but I don't have uh, time. So let me just uh, finish by uh, 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 stating uh, the result in uh, in the case of several variables. Uh, so if you have a larger number of points, uh, then you can compute this Heke modification uh, and uh, you obtain uh, this uh, Heke operator. So this is the formula for the Heke operator uh, in uh, uh, the case of arbitrary number of points. Uh, so in this case, uh, we act on L2 on the, not on one dimensional space, but on uh, 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 M uh, uh, minus uh, n minus three dimensional space where n is the uh, uh, number of uh, parabolic points, and uh, there you get an integral of this sort, and then we prove that it's it's a bounded uh, and compact operator, and uh, and then uh, you can. Uh, So the proof of compactness of this operator is uh, by, so you basically prove that some power of this operator is compact. And uh, for the power you show that it has a kind of nice uh, uh, kernel. So the difficulty, there is a theorem that uh, if you have a kind of continuous function of two variables, um, if, uh, on, uh, or maybe continuously differentiable function of two variables, it defines a compact operator, say on an interval or circle, but uh, here the Schwarz kernel is a distribution which is concentrated on a submanifold of lower dimension. But if you raise it to a power, then you can show that everything gets smoothed out using actually representation theory. And uh, you get a nice uh, kernel for which you can establish compactness. And that shows the existence of discrete spectrum. So you get a spectral decomposition and you get uh, various uh, properties similar uh, to before. So, so basically uh, uh, all this package of things uh, works uh, for, uh, uh, for the genus zero. So I, I understand, that, yeah, yeah, so in the physics literature, there were uh, formulas similar to this, but uh, somehow in, in our paper, what uh, mainly we tried to do is uh, to have a, a proof uh, using functional analysis of existence of this spectrum and uh, completeness of this spectrum. Okay, thank you very much. Great, uh, let's uh, thank the speaker for this wonderful talk. And uh, do we have uh, any more questions? I think if you have a question, you can just go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and speak out. Yeah, maybe I should uh, stop sharing because uh, finished. Yes. I had a question. You mentioned uh, um, in passing this interpretation of the the real CP one structures is coming from grafting along some like multi curve. Yes. So. How did, does that picture get used in your story? Not yet. No, we, we, this, uh, we, would like to, uh, we would like to understand how this is related to our story, but we haven't done so yet. I see. It should be. I think it should be related, but uh, it's, uh, it isn't yet. Also, we discussed it a little bit with Gaiota and Witten, but we haven't uh, finished anything. I see, I see. Um, I also had a more technical question. At the beginning, you said that, that it's kind of easy to see that these operators are defined uh, on the locus of functions that are supported on the, the very stable. Uh, um, that's tables. right, yes. So is it easy to say why that is? Well, that's because uh, if you take a very stable bundle, what does it mean very stable? This means that, uh, okay, not only uh, the degree of uh, a sub bundle uh, less is less than the degree of the, uh, sorry, not only the slope of the sub bundle is less than the slope of the vector bundle, but it is much less. It is less by, by a wide margin. So when you do a Heike modification, you, you, you don't really spoil it that much. So that's basically the reason. 
I see. Thank you. Because the problem is that if you, uh, you, you may obtain, uh, so when you uh, uh, do a Hecke modification to a stable bundle, you may obtain an unstable bundle. And so that means that uh, in, in, in this pl place, uh, your inter integra the integral may diverge at that point. I see, but you're saying if, if it's very stable, that doesn't happen. It, it's Hecke modifications are also stable. Yeah, so then, uh, then it's somehow controlled. Got it. Pasha, how do you prove completeness? Okay, so yeah, so that, that's, you, you have to prove that this operator is compact. And then um, if you have a compact self-adjoint operator, it has a, a basis of eigenfunctions. And then you show that all of those eigenfunctions are uh, uh, related to real authors. So, uh, so that's how you prove completeness. So that was the point that was difficult for us because you can construct these eigenfunctions just as solutions of the differential equation. But it's not clear why they are complete, why they form a basis of L2. And uh, so that's, uh, that's the tool how to do this. We did in, the, in our first paper, we did not uh, know this Hake operator. I mean, we did not uh, study these Hake operators. We somehow uh, didn't realize that they were, would be so useful. And so we just uh, constructed uh, self-adjoint extensions of these Hitchin uh, Hamiltonians, or rather they are real parts. And uh, th that's a lot of work. And we were only able to do that in a uh, four po point case. But then we realized that these Hecke operators, uh, and that's because they are unbounded, kitchen operators are unbounded. And unbounded self-adjoint operator is a big pain in the neck. So you, there are many extensions. Sometimes they are not essentially self-adjoint. So you have to say which extension. In other words, it's a question about what kind of boundary conditions you put at the singularity, so to speak. But um, somehow the integral operators do this for you because they are compact. And so they're, uh, uh, you don't have to uh, define their self-adjoint extension. They are already self-adjoint. And uh, this gives you a spectral decomposition. And then you can prove that it's respected by uh, Hitchin operators. So you obtain a self-adjoint extension of the Hitchin operator for free from this. There is also all the... Uh... Cn Yang way of doing such things, which is you expand, uh, you find a good expansion, and in each order you require L2 condition, and that leads to beta equation. That's how Yang did in 69. Yang and Yang, well, for different system, of course, but so you, you find the expansion in some parameter around self-adjoint operators that you know, and then in each order of expansion requires the L2. And that leads to condition which they wrote as a beta equation. But it was something called Bose Gas, it's a simpler system. But that's a very such approach. Have you, have you looked at it? No, we haven't. Actually, you, you have to. Uh, so uh, the question is around which point to expand. So this Lame equation, okay, you, you can degenerate it when, uh, you know, points, you know, these four points collide and the. Uh, Degenerated to yes, yes. Like okay. David, David knows that. That's exactly what you do. You, you pick the fourth point, right, and tend to one of the limits, to zero, one, or infinity. Right, expansion in that. <clears throat> yeah. So order by order require L two on the solution, and each order of the expansion, let's call that parameter Q, right, that fourth point. And in each order, you get some equation, and then you sum it up. And I mean, the, the, the physicists, of course, do it um, by knowing that it is uh, it can be summed up and it's analytic and so on. Yeah, but it is going to be a pain. So we will, uh, yeah, that's a good uh, good suggestion. Oh, that, that follows. Sorry, sorry, Pasha. That follows. I mean, from the other story of studying the gauge theories and so on. The fact that that expansion actually has a finite radius of curvatures was proven. So you just right, but we cannot use anything from gauge theory because gauge theory is a no, 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 no. It's not gauge theory. Andre Okunko would be offended actually. So they proved it mathematically that that expansion converges. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. I mean that's what I, I have to look what into I'm saying. It. What I'm saying is that the Young in 1969, that famous 
thermodynamic wet ansatz paper had to prove the completeness of the spectrum of this, you know, um, delta function potential, the, the famous what's called the Young and Young system, I think, or something. Mm -hmm. uh, Lieb Lineker or whatever. You have a second order differential operator on a circle with delta function potential. And Young and Young solved it by expanding it to basically free Fermi. Mm -hmm. And then they proved that uh, the answer uh, is uh, complete because you know that the just the case with the sure functions is complete. So anyway, that can be adapted to oppers. Mm -hmm. And the statement, what I just said, that it's known that it's analytic and convergent, blah, blah, blah. That comes from, I mean, the people know that long before. So anyway, I thought that you had similar way of doing this, but you said that you invented completely different way of yeah, it's a completely different way. It's using these Heike operators because then, then it somehow becomes much simpler. If you can show that they are compact, which is important anyway, then somehow everything uh, goes, uh, the rest is kind of uh, uh, soft. <laughs> and compactness is a question about algebraic geometry. It's a question about the type of singularities you have. So we still don't have a proof, but uh, in, in higher genus, but uh, in genus zero, it's, it's in fact quite easy, so. But, but torus with one point should be almost same. Ah, yeah, yeah. Torus, torus with one point is the same, uh, yes, and uh, the, this is not written up, but this can be done. And uh, I, I expect that actually torus with any number of points can be done by a similar uh, technology. But uh, higher genus already is, uh, becomes harder. So you need to have some good ideas to, to do this. Genus two can be done because uh, genus two is uh, related to uh, six points uh, uh, on P1. There, there are some relations on that, yeah. But also um, SLN can be done for special monodromes. If, if, you, put, if you fix uh, two points having completely judge, I mean, AGT, for example, has same thing. So if you fix two points to have completely degenerate monodromy, but the rest point to have arbitrary monodromy, that can be done also. Yes, I think so. So, so it's actually, actually, there are many interesting cases. There is Kalodra Moser case. And actually there is a paper by Rusinars, which in, some, in, the, in spirit is close to what we do. So he, uh, this paper, he defines spectrum of uh, Kalodra Moser system. Uh, because and he says, okay, it has singularities, so it's not obvious what kind of boundary condition to put. But we can construct an integral operator that commutes with uh, uh, this uh, differential operator and uh, take its spectrum, and, and then it will be also a spectrum of this operator, different differential operator. And so it turns out that at least for Lame, he has a special paper for Lame, and, and in that case, uh, his operator is a limiting case of this Heike operator. It's uh, basically, as I said, Heike operator behaves like uh, a scalar times some log factor when a point goes to infinity, but then there is a second term of the expansion. And that second term is exactly the Struzinar's operator. So you had a, I had a question in a very uh, sort of different direction. Um, is it possible to um, say anything about the relation between this and the algebraic story? Is there any interplay uh, or are these just uh, completely- Oh, the algebraic story, uh, you mean the, the geometric languages or, or- Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so in the geometric languages, we, we have these uh, automorphic shifts, which are D modules on uh, band G. And these D modules, uh, so, if, if you have an upper connection, the corresponding D module is exactly this uh, uh, corresponding to the eigenvalue problem of the Hitchin uh, okay. system. Thanks. Okay. So, so the, that's uh, basically the relation. Uh, can I ask you something? Yes. Uh -huh. For the genus zero with the mark point, uh, the corresponding Hitchin system is known to be the Gedang system. That's right, yes. And then I would have to assign GL2 representations at each mark point. 
That's if I right. purely look at the uh, in the integral system point of view. Uh, in the in the case that you showed us, well, is it just the fundamental representation, or are you considering more? Uh, no. So so uh, this is the related to the previous question about twisting. Yes. Uh, so uh, in fact, uh, you should assign representations. Uh, so the representations you assign, so it's a Gaudin system, but it's a Gaudin system in the tensor product of infinite dimensional representation. Uh, it's not, I mean, there is a version of this uh, for real fields where uh, it will be the just literally the usual Gaudin with finite matrices on a tensor product. But, uh, but actually, if you want to consider, uh, well, it has to be operators on infinite dimensional space. So actually, at every point, you put principal series representation corresponding to the zero uh, value of the central character, basically. Uh, not zero, but uh, I mean, how to say it? Uh, well, uh, it, it basically, it's, it's a principal series representation, which is just half densities on P1. Sorry, from Gaudin language, this is SL2C actually. Right, SL2C. So it's a principle series of SL2C. It's right. SL2 so over whatever field you're working on. So it's always infinite dimension. Uh, over complex numbers, if you, uh, well, I mean, if, unless you twist, it will be always infinite dimensional. Uh, well, it needs to be a unitary representation to have a good spectral theory. Uh, <laughs> But uh, if you use an, uh, uh, if you use uh, if you work over the real numbers, you are allowed to consider real forms of your uh, Lie group, and in particular, you can consider SU two, and um, and then you can put finite dimensional representations because they will be unitary, and then it will be the usual. Then then, then you will get a finite dimensional sp uh, space. Thank you. The general picture is that you have some real group. Uh, so the complex numbers, you have a complex Lie group, uh, complex semi-simple Lie group, and you have uh, real, like reductive, and you have some uh, unitary representations. Uh, for real, uh, you need to fix a real form and some unitary representations. So there is a, for real, the story is much more complicated and uh, I don't want to get into that right now, so it's... All right, so maybe we have time for one last question if someone has one. Or if not, then let's, uh, let's thank uh, the speaker again. Thank you. And, okay, I'll stop the, well, let's, the, let's end the formal part of this. So uh, uh, I welcome you all uh, in two weeks time when we'll have uh, uh, Nadi Cyber and I'll stop the recording, but I'll leave the room open if we want to chat some more. Thanks a lot, Tasha. Yes, thank you.